Okay, poker to everybody. It's 11 o'clock. Uh, time to get started really on uh, uh, a very special o occasion, the 24th Sefer of the 24 books of Tanakh. I want to give everybody um, a muzzle tov. This has really been an inspiring, inspiring summer. And I want to thank you all for, for coming, you know, day in and day out, three, three times a week as we've gone through all 24 books of Tanakh. I want to thank Rabbi Adam Mintz, who's online now, and Shira Hech a caller from 929 who we, we we partnered together when I sort of, I mentioned the idea, they thought, you know, they joined in right away and they helped in terms of speakers, a lot of uh, the background work. So I want to thank Adam and uh, and Shira for all their help and, and 929 and of course to thank you and all the speakers for for coming. Uh, today, Shira. just want to say thank you to Rabbi Jay who um, spearheaded the whole project and a tremendous ishkayach to you. It was amazing the number of people who came and thanks for partnering. It's been a great partnership. Here's to many more in the, in the months and years ahead. Amen. Thank you very much, Adam. Thank you. Um, today's shear being sponsored by, by Shana and Laser Friedman, Lili Nishma, Matshana's mother, Malka Bat Ravchaim Yoshua, uh, may the Neshama have an aliyah, and I want to thank Laser and Shana, who are good friends of ours on, on a personal level, good friends of, of Tor in Motion for all our medical conferences that they put together. And we want to thank all of you for your support, uh, those who have given financial support, but the more important, the, the support of, of, of coming and learning and participating with us. And we look forward to Elosman, which begins on Thursday morning at 11 a.m. with Rabbi Alex Israel. I'm sure you've all seen the schedule. You know, you have to re-register. It'll be uh, a a different link to enter into all these classes. And we look forward to learning with you and uh, hearing your feedback. And really, thank you very much. And I think I've spoken enough and we'll hand it over to Rabbi Liebtag. Thank you, Rabbi Jay. And before we begin, of course, we have to thank Rabbi Jay and, and everyone who organized it, and Rabbi Mintz and Shira. Uh, just one thing that I learned so far, I've been listening, not live, usually on recordings, uh, I re-understood what it means by the people of the book. Like we're known as the people of the book. And I see now that what I gain most, I learned about a lot of different people. When a person teaches a book, you learn about the book, you also learn about yourself, about the person. So the, the people that we've met and the range of people and the interests and their different approaches, I've learned so much from the way people study the Tanakh, almost like through the Tanakh, you can become a sort of catalyst to see the person and their, um, and their insights on life. I think, of course, we learn from the books, but for sure, we also learn a lot about the people and we gained a lot. So the idea of everyone doing a different book was just tremendous. Um, what I want to begin with is another sponsorship for today's share. Is today's share sponsored by Psuke de Zimra? So you've heard of them? We sort of joke around that Psuke de Zimra is the mitzvah for Shavuos morning, because usually we skip Psuke de Zimra or we come late, but on Shavuos morning, we step all night so we can say the whole thing, or maybe on Rosh Hashanah, we come early. What do I mean? Everyone knows Pesukit Zimra, so it begins with Baruch Shamar, but the, the opening section of Pesukit Zimra is what's called Hodu Lashem Kiru Bishmo. Either we say it before Baruch Shamar or after Baruch Shamar. Nusach Ashkenaz and Svar. In fact, I can share my screen real fast. And uh, we have a little Rinat Yisrael sitter right here. It should be here. Where are we? Here we go. Um, oh, Murphy's Law here. We have to close that one. Um, Chrome, here we are. There we go. Okay. Um, this is Arena Tisrael Center, you'll see. And Hodu Lashem is the beginning of Psukit Zimra, Tilat Shahar. And look where it's from. From Divrei Amin. You would think it would be from Tilim. No, it's from Divrei Amin. And of course, we have lots of Tilim afterwards. And when the Tilat the David and all the Hallelujahs are over, Guess what we have? I'm sure you remember by heart. Um, we have Vayvarech David. And where's Vayvarech David from? Again, from Dibrei Hayamim. So by the time this year is over, I want you to appreciate, hope you appreciate sort of the take-home message that deep, from Dibrei Hayamim, you can, you'll be able to understand a little bit better what is in the Siddur and why we quote these sections, Stavka, specifically from Dibrei Hayamim. So that was our early sponsorship. Now I want to um, take off this screen share. I want to talk about a dilemma that all the speakers have had. There's two types of books, or two types of shirim when you give this 24 and H series. There's books that everyone knows and everyone's read before, 
So the speaker of Megillat Esther does not have to review what's the story of Megillat Esther. Everyone knows it, Megillat Ruth, Sefer Brashid even. And the job of the speaker is to share with you his insights on the book, because everyone knows the book. When it comes to Diver Yamim, I highly doubt anyone in this group has read the book from cover to cover, unless maybe they did 929. And rarely has anyone ever studied the book. And before they started 929, I don't think everyone ever read it in the right mind. Now, I have an analogy for those who learn Talmud and Gemara. I call Divar Yamim, the way it's understood, is the Tosefta of Mesechet Malachim. I'll try to explain, if you understand what I mean. In the back of, the, of every Mesechet, of every you know, Talmud Bavli, there's what's called the Tosefta. Basically, the Mishnayot had never made it. No one ever learns the Tosefta, unless you're Professor Lieberman. No one ever learns it, but rather, you always look it up. And when you're learning a Mishnah, oh, you know, the, the Rebbe or Big Rosh Yeshivas, they quoted Tosefta and you can find it somewhere. But no one learns it in order. In a similar way, everyone learns Sefer Shmuel and Sefer Malachim. Every once in a while, there's a story in Sefer Malachim and Sefer Shmuel, where if you look in Divar Yamim, you'll see some additional information, maybe an alternate version or something like that. And the, most of us encounter Divar Yamim, not only in the Siddur, but also when we study Sefer Malachim or Sefer Shmuel, we'll hear an, an alternate or a filling in story. And I think one of the reasons for that is, A, it's in the end of the book, it's end of Tanakh, but people think it's just a repeat. And why read it if we read Sefer Melachim? And therefore, we usually never study, it's, it's never, I don't think I've ever seen a high school class or a high school curriculum that includes Sefer learning Dibra Yamin. And I think the blame goes on the name of the book. Because the name of the book in English is Chronicles, which is a translation of Dibra Yamin, but the book is not Chronicles. So when I call a book Chronicles, I'm assuming the book is a history book, written to teach you history. And the books of prophecy, or the books in Tanakh, are books not written to teach you history. They include history, but they carry a message either from God or from his prophets. They're coming to teach you something. And every time you learn a book in Tanakh, you always have to ask yourself, what was its prophetic purpose? For what reason was the book composed? And what I want to discuss with in the beginning is trying to understand what was the purpose of Divar Yamim? Who wrote it? Why was it written? And in light of that, we'll understand what's in the book and what's not in the book. Now, um, why is the book called Divar Yamim? First of all, in the Gemara it's called Divar Yamim, but I'll show you what misleads people. And we'll go to our first source now. We'll start our source sheet here. Um, I'll share when I'm done the source sheet I'm using today. I'll, we'll give out to everyone at the end. It will be on the website. So. Um, why people never read the book, A, it's the end, it's long, and we think it's there already. Now, when you learn Sefer Melachim, many times we have this verse, Many times in Sefer Melachim, the story is over. At the end of the story, we say, if you want to hear, read more about Yerovam, look in Divrei Yamim. You want to read more about Menashe, read in, look in Divrei Hayamim, Lamachai Yehuda. And people have the mistaken understanding that Sefer Melachim is referring to our Dibra Yamim. But that can't be, because there aren't, it's simply not true, because Dibra Yamim was not written when Sefer Melachim was written. It's written later. We'll prove why in a minute. But because of that, people simply think that this is Dibra Yamim, but it's not. What is this Dibra Yamim? Every royal family, every royal, any monarchy, has their scribes, and they write the history of the king and the history of the royal family and the history of events of the land. And therefore, there were the chronicles of the kings of Yehuda, there were chronicles of the king of Israel. We don't have those books, even though our prophets quote from them. In other words, when Sefer Melachim was written, Yirmiyahu had those books in front of him, but we've lost them in the meantime. Our Divar Yamim is a different composition. Now, before we talk about why it was written, I want to talk about another problem. Why is it the last book of Tanakh? That was, why am I betting, clean, not clean up, or mafter, or glila, whatever it's called? It's, why, um, why is it the last book? So the truth is, it's a machloka. It's an argument, like everything in Judaism, because no one wrote the entire Tanakh. Our Tanakh, our 24 books, is a collection of works that wasn't finalized until you know, much later in Jewish history. And in the Talmud, we talk about some books make it, some books don't make it. Each book wasn't written as part of a, a series of 24 books. Every book was written for its own reason, after several thousand years or so, we finally have a collection of 24 books that the rabbis that the rabbis canonized. 
Now, once they're canonized, what the Gemara talks about, if someone has a, uh, an inheritance of books, what can you divide up, what you can't divide up, certain books you can't cut in, let's say there's two sons who inherit, say for Ruth. So I can't cut Ruth in half and you get the first two chapters and you get the last two chapters. So that's how um, Baba Batra talks about the books. And almost tangentially, they say, oh, by the way, these are the books. And they ask, what order do we put them in? So in Talmud Bavli, Baba Batra, what's the order of Ketuvim? We have Ruth and Tehilim and Eov and Mishlei, Kohelet, Shira, Shirim, Kinot, Daniel, Megillat, Esther, Ezra, and Divar Yamin. So Divar Yamin is last, but in case you ever, oh, we can't see it anymore, but the Keter Aram Tzova, the famous uh, like D, D text, uh, which is following the Tiberian tradition, their Divar Yamin is at the beginning of Ketuvim. In fact, in Raboyer's Tanakh, in some publications, Divar Yamin is in the beginning of Ketuvim and not at the end. I'm, I'm going to try to give a reason why Divrei Amim, even though it's chronologically not last, why um, it was decided in the Babylonian tradition to make it last. I'll give two reasons. A simple reason and a, a little more deeper reason. First of all, why should it not be last? Because if you know the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, Ezra, um, Professor Zakheim talked about this very nicely, that Ezra and Nehemiah are the last books of Tanakh chronologically, and the book of Ezra means Ezra and Nehemiah, and the book of Ezra happens after Divar Yamim. We'll prove it in a minute. In fact, the last two lines of Divar Yamim are the first two lines of the book of Ezra. So there's no doubt that chronologically, the book of Ezra and Nehemiah belong after Divar Yamim. And therefore, there's no logic to put Divar Yamim last and have Ezra beforehand. So I want to give a simple reason, a logical reason why. It's called a happy ending. If I'm organizing the 24 books, I don't want the last line of these 24 books. Remember when you buy a book, you look at the end of it. You want to see what the ending is going to be and see whether it's worth reading. So if the last line of the book is Nehemiah saying, I get a lot of credit for this. Remember Professor Zakheim talked about that, about, um, you know, it's his memoirs, but he takes a lot of credit for what he's doing. And the rabbis were even a bit critical of that. That wouldn't be a nice way to end of Tanakh. But if I look at the last line of Divari Amim, and now we can share a Tanakh, at least stop the share here. Um, I'm going to use, there's so many different Tanakhs I can use. But I'm going to use a, um, here we go. I'm going to use a, uh, this Divar Yamim. Oh, no, let's use a better one. This is easier. If I take Divar Yamim, uh, oh, this is Aleph and Bet together. So Tuvim, we need Divar Yamim Bet. Here we go. If we look at the very last line of the book, all the way at the end, we have a beautiful ending. What's the ending? Um, in the first year of Koresh, the king of Paras, just as God, is this the Yirmiyahu had predicted or prophesied? Guess what? Koresh makes the famous declaration, Komer Koresh Melech Paras. God gave me all these lands and he gave me, instructed me to have the temple in Jerusalem built, in Yerushalayim, Asher Yehuda. Mi bechem b'chol amo ye Hashem elavi mo Anyone among the nation who wants and desires to go and build a Mikdash in Yerushalayim, let him go and ascend and go. Isn't that a beautiful ending for, the, for a set of books? It's, if I'm, a, if I'm the final redactor and deciding how to end these 24 books and put a collection, if I end with Divar Yamim, it's such a nice ending that it begins with recovery. And therefore, whoever wants to make Aliyah and return to Israel, almost whoever wants to complete the theme of the Bible and return to Jerusalem and become God's people again, let him sort of make Aliyah. So I think for a logical reason, this ending is a great way to end the 24 books. And that's a good logical reason. Now I want to give a thematic reason. In case you forgot, if I go back to um, these last lines, in case you forgot, in the book of Ezra, just for the fun of it, we'll show you, just to prove what we said before, if I look at the book of Ezra, the first line of Ezra is exactly the last two lines of Divar Yamin. The first year of Koresh, as Yirmiyahu said, Koresh's famous declaration to build the house. Crystal clear? So chronologically, there's no doubt Ezra belongs after Divar Yamim, but um, for a good logical thematic reason, to have a happy ending, we put Divar Yamim last. Now I want to give a thematic reason. What do I mean? What I want to claim is, once I consider the purpose of the book's composition, I need the book of Ezra to understand the book of Divar Yamim. I'll explain what I mean. When I read Divar Yamim and study the book, even though it's talking about the first temple period, and is before Shivat Zion, 
it was written for Shivat Zion. Shivat Zion means the return of Zion. It's only once I read the story in the book of Ezra, and I'm aware of the history of the book of Ezra, can I appreciate the purpose of the composition of the Bariyamim. That'll be my key point today. And I want to talk about prophetic purpose. Let me go back to my outline and just make this point, try to make it clear. Where's my outline over here? Here we go. Um, so why it's the last book of Tanakh? We read the, uh, oh, by the way, who wrote it? So the Anshay Knesset Gdola wrote the Cheskel. Uh, now, when, when the Gemara says Anshay Knesset Gdola wrote um, Treyasar, they didn't write Hosea. They organized it. They're called the prophetic redaction. They put the final touches on the books and they put the 12 together and decide the order, but they don't write the books, they organize them. And therefore, when the Gemara talks about who wrote the books, it's not who wrote them, it's who put them together in the final form. We call it prophetic redaction. Sometimes the word redaction doesn't sound too good, but it's totally legal. It makes sense. It's the men of the great assembly put the final touches on the books that we have. They didn't write them, but they, they're like, if you know, if you ever published a book, the, the editor gets the final word, what's in and what's not. I can imagine uh, Yishayel was really complaining, oh, there were so many great nevolt of mine you skipped. And there's this, listen, 66 chapters is enough. No one's gonna, no, no one's gonna read your book if it's too many. And you, know, you gotta cut somewhere. Now, then it says, Ezra wrote his book, and the yachas of Diver Yamim, not to tell his own yachas, and then we bring a proof from um, a view of Rav that Ezra came, before Ezra came, he made sure who was Jewish, he wanted to know who was a Jew, and he had to say for Yuchasin. And then who finished the book? Nehemiah. So we see that Chazal attribute Diver Yamim to composition in the Second Temple period. That's crystal clear. Now, I want to give a reason why the book is written. Um, I'm going to take a five minute break because the show really didn't start yet. Because the main, again, the main purpose of my share today is try to understand why the book was written. Once I understand why it was written, then I can explain why we have differences between Divrei Amim and Sefer Melachim and all the discrepancies and what's in and what's not in. But I want to talk about what I call prophetic purpose. Every time I read a book, none of the books of Tanakh were written to tell me what happened but rather they carry a message from God. For example, when I read the first chapter of Rashid, I'm not learning, wasn't written to teach me how God created, it's coming to explain me why God created, why he made man, or what's the purpose of his relationship with man. And a scientist can prove to you that it didn't happen the way Chumash says, so that doesn't mean a thing. God gave me a book to understand my connection to God. And sometimes uh, the way things are written don't, m- might not reflect historical reality, but they reflect a, uh, a prophetic message. And when I'm reading Sefer Breshit, am I reading the story of my ancestry or am I understanding why we were chosen? Is Sefer Breshit the story of the Exodus or a story of a covenant between God and the people? Now, uh, so that's easy for Chumash. Chumash is basically the very concept of God, not just creating, but choosing a nation to serve him forever. Or basically Chumash in Torah, we build the concept of a Jewish people and our covenant with God and why we're chosen. And in Nevim, Nevim's job is to make sure it's working. It was, um, first we build something, and then we have maintenance. So the job of the Nevim is to make sure it's keeping to its goals, and when it goes wrong, to fix things. Now, if you just read Nevim, like you've been studying, especially the books of Nevim Rishonim, we have a pretty sad history, don't we? We look like really bad, because almost every single book is about how bad we are. And when you read Tanakh as the history of the Jewish people, we have a really, I guess, um, dysfunctional nation because we're always doing things that are bad. You think God would be really angry with us. That's because we're reading Tanakh as a history book. If we read it as a book of rebuke and it's a history of how prophets try to keep Israel on the right path, then it's not the history of the Jewish people. It's the history of how the prophets try to keep the Jewish people in right direction and rebuke them to keep them on, on, uh, on the right path. And when I'm reading a book of rebuke, of course there'll be mostly rebuke. The goal of the Nevim is not to tell you what happened. Now, I can read that rebuke and learn about my history. It's the same way if, if you go to college and learn um, medieval Jewish history, like a lot of people have done. No one wrote a book of medieval Jewish history. A lot of people wrote shooting, wrote responsa. I can study responsa and from responsa I can derive what must have happened historically. So no one wrote responsa to teach you Jewish history, but when I study Jewish history, I can learn a lot from responsa. Got the idea? Same thing. I can learn a lot about Jewish history by reading the works of the Nevim, but the works of the Nevim were not written to teach me history. 
I'm getting the works of the words of prophets who their job was to keep Israel on the right track. And that's why it's always so negative. And that's what's so great about us. And that's why, because we're so down on ourselves, we're always trying to learn from our mistakes. That's what keeps us going. We get um, one promise in education today. Everyone gets straight A's. Everyone's the greatest. Everyone's the best. You don't improve if you don't get, um, if, if you don't self-examine yourself and introspect and ask, how can I do better? You're never going to grow. You can't overdo it. Other problems, but I'm trying to explain that the books of Tanakh are not coming to explain what happened. I'll give a quick example and say for Yoshua. Yoshua wasn't written to tell us how God, how we conquered the land, but rather, did God keep his promise? God promised to help us conquer the land. Did God keep his promise? The people say, hey, we didn't finish conquering the land. God says, I kept my promise. I promised to help you wherever you go. I didn't say do it for you. I said I did it with you. And the book comes to prove that God kept his promise. And therefore, what's in the book? How God kept his promise. And if something didn't happen, who's to blame? If you lost the battle of the eye, it's because you sinned. If you didn't conquer land, because you didn't take initiative, because you were lazy. I did what I promised. Whatever you fought, I was there to help you. Okay, and that's a Yeshua in a nutshell. So when I take that prophetic purpose into consideration, when I'm coming as a Navi to explain God's point of view and saying God did keep his promise, I'm presenting the events not as an historian, but I'm presenting the events to explain, to give a prophetic message. If I'm Shmuel the Navi, and during my time period, the people want a king, and I think it's a bad idea, and God thinks it's a good idea, I need to explain to the people why is God giving you a king, even though I think it's a bad idea. I need to write Sefer Shoftim to explain why I think it's a bad idea, and why God says it's a good idea. Remember, because the last time you asked for a king, no, I mean, um, Gidon said, bad idea. And look, and look at the fine mess that brought us to. No, Gidon meant well, no king. But when Gideon said no, we just went downhill. We got stuck with Abimelech and all the not so good Shoftim. You follow? The same thing. In Sefer Shmuel, it's not just the history of Shaul and David. I need to understand that David was indeed chosen by God, despite all the rumors. There's so much dirt on David going around for good reason, because during the, sec during the first temple period, there's a split kingdom. And if I want to legitimize the northern kingdom, if I want to legitimize uh, God's temple in Beit El, and serving God with Bamot, like 10 of the 12 tribes were doing, the way to legitimize my position is to delegitimize my opponent. That's, we know that from Israeli politics. If you don't talk about how good, by delegitimizing the other, that's how you legitimize yourself. So there's so much delegitimization of King David that I need a work of prophecy to explain, despite all these rumors, God did choose him. That's why there's so much negative stories about David, because they're coming to counter them and explain them. So I don't need a book to tell me what happened. I need a book to clarify once and for all that God wanted King David to be king, even though he was never anointed publicly. I explain why he wasn't. I need, he was king, even though the sin of Bathsheba. And it wasn't, it wasn't his idea to kill Avner. That was Yoav, et cetera. So I hope, I hope, I just brought those examples that the books that we're reading, they each have a prophetic purpose and the purpose is not to teach you history. There's a prophetic message. And first I have to understand what that message is in light of that message, I can understand the content of the book, which will explain what's in the book and what's not in the book. Now we go to the differences between our book and Divar Yamim, and, and basically Divar Yamim is parallel with half of Sefer Shmuel about David and um, Sefer Melachim. Sefer Melachim was composed or redacted by Yirmiyahu because Yirmiyahu was the prophet in the time of the Chorban, of the temple being destroyed. And he has to explain why was the temple destroyed? You know, he blames on the split kingdom. He blames it on Yerobam. He blames it on a lot of things. He blames it later on on, um, on Shlomo going astray. But I'm writing a book not just to tell you what happened. I need to explain why this temple, why the first monarchy, why the first temple period failed. And in light of that, I bring the kings and go back and forth. Now, to prove his point, he quotes from historical sources like, but he includes its prophetic message. That can explain pretty much uh, why every king has a report card in the book and how we, um, how we look and judge each king. What do we do to unify the country? What did to cause the Korban? Now I want to give a reason why Divar Yamim was written. Remember, Sefer and Lachim is already written, finished, before Divar Yamim is written, even though it's talking about the same time period. The destruction of the first temple is a shock to the Jewish people. 
because from the time the Torah was given until the temple was destroyed, the Jewish people were living in their land. We have our ups and our downs, but Am Yisrael is living in the land of Israel, so we lose some tribes. We lose, we have our borders shrink, and they grow and they shrink. But the center of the Jewish people is always in the land of Israel. After the exile of, of the Babylonian exile, especially after the temple was destroyed, there basically is no longer a community in Israel, and the whole center of the Jewish people is now in Babylonian exile. And the big question is, will there ever be recovery? Especially because all the false prophets were saying before that it would never happen. And when all the prophets and the rabbis are telling you, it can't happen, God's house can't be destroyed, and it is destroyed, that's why Yirmiya was coming to counter that, there's a good chance that when Am Yisrael is in exile, they're going to lose all hope. They'll give up on God. God, God remember, we just read Echa about a month ago. Remember, God abandoned us. He left his people. He didn't help us. How could that be? The biggest fear in exile is there'll never be recovery. Yirmiyahu promised there will be recovery. It will take, you know, some seven years until things will change. And the Babylonians have to fall before the Persians take over. But be patient. The people were saying we're like dry bones, if you remember Yechezkel. And Yirmiyahu said, and Yechezkel says these dry bones will come back to life. Sure enough, like we just read, the Babylonians fall to the Persians, and the first, Bab the first Persian king, Cyrus, some, some 50 years after the temple was destroyed, makes the same declaration, it's time to return, the Jews can return. The question is, is that the hand of God? Because God says, I'll bring you back. Could it be that this declaration of King Cyrus means it's time to return? So some people came, most people didn't come. The problem was the people who came under Koresh, and we have to go over a little history here. Uh, let me share my screen here a little bit. If you remember the history, Cyrus is the first Persian king. I followed the outside historical dates. Cyrus is in 538. Uh, Cambyses is a different king in between. Maybe Achashverosh is in 530. And Darius the Great, Daryavish, is in 522. What's important here, there's almost 20 years between the Cyrus Declaration and the temple being built in the time of Daryavish. Was, even though they returned under Koresh with great hope to build the temple, the temple doesn't get off the ground. There's an intifada. Remember, there's the, the local population doesn't let them build. They write letters. And there's a building freeze for some 20 years until King Daryavish. I'm going to read with you. And then finally, the temple was finally built in the second year of Daryavish. They break ground. They finish in year six. There's an Avi during that time period, the two Navim, Haggai and Zcharia. I want to read with you the opening line of Haggai which in my opinion is key to understanding why we're going to write and why someone's going to compose our book of Divar Yamin. It's 18 years after they've returned, going nowhere. People are down and depressed, if you know the book of Haggai. And in the second year of Dayavesh, again, 18 years after the Cyrus Declaration, and those who made Aliyah are down and depressed, we're going nowhere. God gives a message through his Navi Haggai to Zerubbabel, who's the political leader, and Yeshua is the Kohen. And what does he say? Come, Hashem, tzvot lemor. Ha'am aze amru lo eid boet beit Hashem libanot. The people are saying this is no time to build the temple. The people have given up hope, even those who returned. What is Chagai's job? His job is to inspire the people, get to work on it. And God wants you to build it. You have to take initiative. And we're not going to read the whole book of Chagai now. That was in Treasar. But if you remember the book of Chagai, it's only two chapters worthwhile reading. Haggai is the Navi who inspires the people. Yes, we can. And sure enough, they break ground. That's on Hanukkah that year. They break ground on Hanukkah. And within four years, it's built. And Zerubbabel gives the messages as well. And thanks to the, the leadership of Haggai and Zerubbabel, the people in, who return in Bayit Sheni finally get the second temple off the ground. But during that entire time period, there's this approach that's not going to happen. There's a lot of depression and, a lot, and the people need inspiration. What I want to claim is, if I find a book of history of the first temple period written in the second temple period, we can prove the book is written in the second temple period because it goes to the second temple period, the genealogies at least do. My claim is the book was written as a book of inspiration for the people of the second temple period to learn from and be inspired by all the efforts done by the people of the first temple period to build the temple. Got it? And therefore, I'm going to talk about King David because what made King David special? 
He was the first Jewish leader who wanted to build a temple. All the other Shoftim, we never find Shoftim, oh, we want to build a temple for God. Even when Shol becomes king, he's worried about his kingdom. The, the, the Mishkan at Shiloh was destroyed. It's collecting dust. In fact, he destroys, he destroys no, no Kohanim. The Mishkan and the Aron are collecting dust during the time of King Shaul. When David becomes king, his first agenda and his highest priority is getting the Mishkan back together again, building a Mikdash, bringing the Aron, God's Ark, back together, and getting the nation on its feet, not only politically, but also religiously. And the model of leadership, of national leadership, to build a temple, and not to build a temple, but build a country, and build a people as God's people, David, that's what makes him special. Now, David has his problems. That's, that's in the book of Shmuel. The book of Dever Amim only tells the stories about all the efforts that David does to build Yerushalayim and the Mikdash. Once you understand that, it explains every story that's in the book and every story that's not in the book. I don't need to know about David and Bathsheba. And, and if anyone who's learned a little bit about Dever Amim, in the academic circles, what will they tell you? They call the book Chronicles. Think it's an alternate history, but because in the book of Chronicles, we don't find anything bad about David or Shlomo, where they say, oh, this is a chronicle written by the Davidic authors, and they um, wipe out, or what's the fancy word for it? Um, they, uh, what's the fancy word when you? Censor. That's it. They censor all the bad stuff. And like how, it would be a book for Mark Shapiro to talk about. How they, uh, <laughs> like the making of a gadol. He could only do, that he's perfect. And we can't say anything bad about him. So it would be, let's, like, let's say, our, our scroll was the, um, they say that the Vivarim is our scroll version of Sefer Shmuel, pretty much. Uh, that's how they view it. And that's how they explain the differences. Now, what's that built on? That's built on an objective analysis of the book. What's it about? What do you do? I compare Sefer Shmuel and Sefer Melachim to Divrei Amin. What do I find? No bad stories about David in Divrei Amin. No good, no, and only good stories about him in Divrei Amin. And any bad stories only in Sefer Shmuel. Some good ones and some bad ones, but mostly bad ones or questionable stories about David. So that's, that's a, but that's subjective interpretation. Just one last word of methodology. Every study of every book has two stages. The first stage is objective analysis, which is objective. What's in the book? What's the story? What's it say? But because the books are written for a purpose, when I read the book, when I do my objective analysis and study what's in the book, I have to ask myself, why is this the book? Why is this here? Why isn't this? Or what's the message of the book? That's subjective interpretation. And our commentators have been doing that for ages. They share with you their objective, subjective analysis. But there's always two stages. Their subjective analysis has to be built on a, on a um, objective, I mean, your subjective interpretation has to be built on a thorough objective analysis. I'll give you a really bad example. If you do an objective analysis of our Bible, oh, there's two names for God, Elohim and Yudke Vavke. You can't miss that. What, what's the subjective interpretation of the Bible critics? Oh, it must be two authors. Got it? What's the subjective interpretation of Chazal or, or, or thing? No, it's one God, but using two different names to explain two different perspectives of our relationship with God, something deeper there. They both do the same objective analysis, but they come to totally different conclusions as far as subjective interpretation. Because all they begin with different assumptions about the purpose of, of composition. Because I understand there's a prophetic purpose. Academians say, no, they're man-made and they have, all their, they have all their different assumptions. So our assumption is the books are prophetic. And if I find you know, oddities in the book, there's a purpose for them. Now, I'll never know if my subjective interpretation is correct, but my interpretation has to be built on an objective analysis of the text. Now, therefore, when I go through the text, which we're going to do now in our class, and we're going to see all the different stories that are there and that's not there, we're going to see what's in um, this point that it's written to inspire the people about building the Mikdash. In addition to that, we're going to find a lot of negative things about the house of David. We're going to find bad things about kings. We're going to find out about King Yoash who did a terrible thing. We read about it on Tishbab. He killed a Navi in the Beit HaMikdash. Zechariah the Navi was killed by the King Yoash. In Malachim, he's a goody goody king. He did nothing wrong. In Divri Amim, he did a terrible thing. Uziel, one of the greatest kings in Sefer Malachim, did nothing wrong. But yes, you know, I told Yasha, in Divri Amim, he, he goes into the Mikdash and is Makhtar Torah. He goes against the Kaonim and he brings incense in the Holy of Holies. That's a terrible sin. In fact, because of that, he gets leprosy. And what do we find out? So if this is written by these Davidic authors, 
and whitewashing everything and censoring, how come those bad stories made it? But if the topic of the book is the Mikdash, then what stories is in Divrei Amim? Anything that has to do with how we treat the Mikdash, for good or for bad, that's in Divrei Amim. If there's a king who mistreated the Mikdash, like Uziel, then the story is there. If there's a king who killed a Navi in the Mikdash, who desecrated the Mikdash by bringing politics into the temple and killing a prophet, that's in Divrei Amim. I hope my point is clear. In fact, how does Sefer Melachim end? Sefer Melachim ends with the restoration of King um, uh, Yehoiachin gets out of jail. It ends with kingdom. How does Sefer Dibrayamim end? With the restoration of the Beit HaMikdash. Got it? You can see from the end of the book what the theme of the book is. It's all about the Mikdash. Again, it goes through the kings. Why only the kings of Yehuda? The kings of Israel is not our topic. Our topic is the Beit HaMikdash in Yerushalayim. And I need to write a book to inspire the people to learn from them. So now, um, what we're going to do now, because I'm going to run out of time, I know. Uh, Jay, if there's questions in the middle, you can interrupt me. If you see any questions, I'm not looking at the... Uh... No, we'll do the questions at the end. There's not too much, yeah. but we can do them in the okay. end. Yeah. No questions. I don't know if that's a good sign or a bad sign. <laughs> um, now, um, I put here the next part um, about, about composition. There's one line which is really important. At the end of Divrei Yamim Aleph, we have a very interesting pasuk that tells you about this idea of, of prophetic redaction. And um, let's share my screen. Let's stop this share. And you know what? I can do it. Uh, here, share my screen, and we get to our Tanakh. And we take the end of Divrei Yamim Aleph. There we go. We go to Vim. This will be easy. And we go to Divrei Yamim Aleph, the very last two lines of the book. Because Divrei Yamim Aleph basically is the story of David. And Shlomo, and to the end, is going to be in Rehamim Bet. Of course, that's an artificial division. It's only one book, historically. What do we tell you? The last two lines. V'divrei David HaMelech, verse 29 in chapter 29. Harishoni v'achronim. Hinam k'tuvim al-divrei Shmoah ha-ro'eh v'al-divrei Natan ha-navi v'al-divrei Gad ha-choseh. In other words, if you want more information about King David, look at the prophecies of the Navi Shmuel, of the Navi Natan, and the Navi David. God. We don't have any of these books. This is not our book, Shmuel. Our book of Shmuel was also redacted by a prophet, quoting from these three Nevi. When I learned Sefer Shmuel, some of the first 16 chapters are from Shmuel. There's about another some 20 chapters from God, and there's another some 20 chapters from Natan, and they go back and forth sometimes. But the book of Shmuel is redacted from these three sources. In the same way, Devarim Aleph is redacted from these three sources, but not all of them. But if you want more information, here's the bibliography. Where to go to look. In Komachuto, Gvoroto, Bukhude, and things that... That was, if you want more information, that's not in, the, in this book. In my book, I talked about the Mikdash. If you want more information, go to the library. And here you see this idea of redaction where the author has books that he quotes from and is aware of them. Doesn't quote completely from them, but quotes selectively from them. But based on that, he puts together his book. Now... Let's go and what I call this is trivia. I'm gonna go and do a quick review of the book and show you some really cute things. First of all, I love the way the book begins. It's like awesome, isn't it? It's like a, a strict version of, of Sefer Breshit. Look how much, how we, how we do 11 chapters in one line. Adam, Sheit, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalel, Yered, Hanoch, Metushel, Achlemech, got that? Isn't that the first like 10 chapters till we get to Noach? Noach, Shem Cham Yafet. Then we get a little more detailed. But in one line, I get 11 chapters of Sefer Breshit. By the way, this is a type of commentary on Sefer Breshit. Now, I'm going to show you something really neat. You know, it looks like just a bunch, it looks like a data dump from Sefer Breshit. You know what a data dump is, when you just get all the information, it's not formatted. I want to format what we have here. I have it in a PDF file. Uh, where's my format? Here we go. Share my screen. And we need PDFs, here we go. Um, now, here we go. I formatted this here. What do we have? Remember 10 generations from Adam to Noach from Perkei Avot? 10 generations from Adam to Noach. Shem Cham and Yafet. Then I have Yafet's kids, Cham kids, and Shem's kids. Just like in Sefer Breshit, but stripped. Guess how many nations we're gonna have? You can take a wild guess, count them up, there's 70. 70 nations from B'nai Noach. Then we go to who? Then we go to shame. Remember, 
when we get to sort of, now we get to chapter 11 in Breshid. Remember, Elo Todot Shem, Shem to Avram Avinu. But we have, again, look at 10 generations, Shem, Arpashad, Shalach, Ever, Peleg, Ru'u, Srug, Nachor, Terach, Avram, Avram, who Avram? Isn't that cute? Avram, Abraham is Avram. That's cool. And then Bnei Abraham, Yitzchak, then Avram, Yitzchak, and Esav, and then Bnei Esav. And then we get to the Melachim, Mechu Be'edom. We get right to Parshat Vayishlach um, at the end. See what we did? You have a stripped version of Breshit, only the Toledot. What's cute is there's 70 nations from B'nai, from B'nai, um, from B'nai Noach, and there's 70, if you count them up, there's 70 offspring from Abraham. And then there'll be 70 offspring from Yaakov going down to Egypt. Now, that theme that there's a universal purpose in God choosing a people, remember in Sefer Breshit? Why, is, why do we make such a big deal about shame? In Sefer Breshit. It's going to come up in Dibre Amin. But why does the story of Avram begin with shame? But Avram's genealogy begins with shame. Why? Because shame was named by Noah to make a name for God. Remember, Baruch Hashem Elohei Shem. Noah wanted shame to be a rabbi. It's a strange name, but he was supposed to make a name for God. Who ended up doing it? Avram made it a family business. Shame, that was his job. He was, that's why Chazal say he's a Rosh Hashiva. Remember Yeshiva Shem Ever? They outlived all the, all, the other genea, all the other descendants, but they're the ones who are talking about God. Ever, like Avram Ha'ivri. The word Ever is really a cool topic in Chumash. Uh, but what I'm trying to show you is that I'm giving my genealogies of Avram from Shem, but I'm contrasting God creating civilization, 70 nations, to God choosing a people that are going to make God's name known. Remember, there's a purpose in Sefer Breshit. There's a purpose for God choosing a people. We're going to want a nation that's going to make a name for God. Now, if you've been paying attention to Sefer Devarim, in fact, if you were true yesterday morning, where did we bring our Bikurim? Hashem 20 times in Sefer Devarim. We never call Jerusalem by its name. We don't call it a temple. What do we call it? We call it by its function. The function of the temple is Hashem Hashem. It's a marketing scheme. God wants a nation. God wants everyone to know about God. You're going to talk about this on Rosh Hashanah if you pay attention to your Moxer. Remember, Aleinu is the introduction to, to um, Machiot. Machiot, that's a big topic. We're not just pronouncing that God is king, but he's our boss. But he's, king, but he's everyone's God, but we're working for him. So it's our job, Aleinu, to praise God, to give him greatness. But we're hoping okay, that, that everyone will call in your name. So we're hoping that God's name will be known. We accomplish that by talking about God and by acting properly. And that'll be, it's one of the mega themes of the Torah. So don't be surprised that this theme of Sefer Breshid is already alluded to in the beginning of, of, of Divrei Amin. Uh, the next one we don't have time for. I'm running out of time, I see. Now, let's go back to our outline and continue. I'm going to do what I call trivia in Sefer, in Sefer Divrei Amin. I'm going to go through the book and point out a couple things. First, I'm going to give it a outline, I'm sorry, uh, an outline of what we're going to talk about. We went to a focus of kingship because we're going to go from the kings of Edom to the kings of, of David. We basically, we'll see, we're going to go from the kings of Edom and we're going right to, to Yehuda and the kings from David. Now, if you know um, Esav and Yaakov, isn't Esav Edom? And, and David is almost like Esav, but he's like Yaakov. Yeah, David and Melech has the voice of Yaakov in the hands of Esav. He's Admoni, I don't know if you know that word. But keep in mind that um, David has something about Yaakov and Esav in him. He's going to fulfill all these blessings we'll see soon. Um, okay, chapter, we don't have to, there's a, yeah, we'll skip uh, about chapter two, but it solves a riddle about who's Yair ben Menashe, because Yair really is not the son of Menashe, Menashe's only son is, is, is uh, Machir, but Machir's daughter married Chetzron's son. And their child was Yair. And therefore, even though Yair is technically from Yehuda, because his mommy is from Menashe, and they took the Gilad, so um, Yair is, becomes associated with Menashe. That's a, that's a whole share. Okay. Chapter 3, we find the Davidic dynasty all the way. You know, it's the proof that the book is written in time of Shivat Zion. We find Zerubbabel, who's a political leader who returns. He's mentioned in the genealogies in 3. Um, there's a question, who's the firstborn of Israel? Is it Reuven Yosef or Yehuda? Maybe we'll take a quick look at that Pasek. Lots of details about the Levim and the Kohanim, all the way again to the time of Ayat Sheni. And the whole focus of these genealogies is primarily on the tribe of Levi. 
and they're different jobs from the time of King David. So what I want to do now, we're going to go through Divrei Bim Aleph. We'll take a quick tour. I'm going to use a um, um, I'm going to use a Hebrew Tanakh, even though I could use a Hebrew English, but it'll be easier to scroll in the Hebrew one. And you can follow in, in a if you have a Tanakh at home, it'll be easier to follow. I'm going to look real quickly at Perak Hay, real fast. Okay, I'll give you the outline with all the sources. But this is really cute. In the genealogies of the first nine, in the first nine chapters of the book is genealogies. Rather boring, but really interesting. B'nai Ruvain, B'chor Yisrael, ki B'chor, he was born first. He's not the firstborn. But because he messed up, the B'chor went to Yosef, because he got a double portion. Okay? V'lo li t'yechis la Ki Yudah gabar b'chav, the nigid v'yemenu v'abuchar v'yosef. In other words, Yudah became the leader. He's a cool guy. But the double portion went to Yosef. Now, who's the leader of Israel? Is it Yosef or Yehuda? Remember Parsha Ba'igash? That's a big theme in Sefer Malachim. Who should be the king? Or the idea of a split kingdom. But we're already alluding to Yehuda taking a leadership position. Remember, first the Mishkan was in the Nachala of, of Yosef in Shiloh, and then it went to David. There's a homies more about it. Ayin Chet and Tilim. Ruven, we can say. Now, let's go to chapter 9 to prove this is the end of the genealogies. So, you know, everyone, all of Israel now had a yachas, and they're written in their genealogy books. And then we talks about those who returned in the beginning of Shiva Tzion, the Yoshvim Rishonim, Asher Bakutam Barayim. In a nutshell, chapter 9 goes back and says, now that we have a yichus, we know where everyone who's living in Israel now in the beginning of the Second Temple period, where they're coming from. Now, if you know the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, there's a terrible problem of intermarriage, isn't there? And we need to know who's a Jew. So don't be surprised that I have a very detailed genealogy of the people who've returned in Shivat Zion of their Jewish roots going back to the first temple period. Because I need to know who's a Jew. Again, that's the side point. But again, it explains, it might help us understand another reason why I have all these genealogies since the introduction to the book. Now we get to our topic. We finished all these genealogies. We end up with um, the family of Binyamin getting to Shaul. And then we start history. And instead of Shaul becoming king and where he's from, etc., we only have the story of Shaul's death in Har Gabor. Got it? We just quote the story of his death. We don't talk about his kingdom at all. Why? Because at the end of the chapter, what do we find? Shaul dies. And what did he do wrong? Um, it says here what he did wrong. He did below Darash. Okay. Um, oh, here. Viamat Shaul. He died because of his sins. Because even though Shaul was appointed and um, anointed king publicly, I need to explain that despite all that, he was unchosen by God and God picked David. That's the background. And that begins our history. Now, we don't have the story of David and Goliath. We don't have the story of David you know, becoming a general in all his battles. What do we go to right away in chapter 11? Right away, everyone gathers together and makes David king over of Israel. We just skipped Ishbosheth. We skipped like seven years from the death of Shaul until David's king. And everyone comes and makes him king. And once everyone makes him king in Hebron, the first thing David does is he captures Yerushalayim. Got it? So of all the stories about David that I skipped, what do I begin with? He's becoming king of all of Israel, uniting the kingdom together and moving his capital from Hebron, the logical place to build, but that's the center of the tribe of Yehuda. He moves his capital to Yerushalayim, he captures Yerushalayim and unites the country. And later he'll build the Mikdash in Yerushalayim. And we have the story of capturing um, Yerushalayim and all the Giborim, basically David bringing all of his men and all of his, um, um, his administration to Yerushalayim. That's chapter 11 and 12. Look at chapter 13. The next story right away is what? David decides, let's bring the Aaron to Yerushalayim. You see his plans? Now, remember, if you go back to Sefer Shmuel, God was a little wary about having a king because a king can lead the people astray. On the other hand, a king can lead the people to find God. So if a king is successful, people won't need God. But if a king is successful and he attributes his success to God, then we have a win-win. We have a great nation and we have God being sanctified. And that's the cutting edge of David over Shaul. By putting the Mikdash and praising God at the center of his, of his conquests and his success, that, that, that's the character that makes Mahut David eternal, plus the fact that he's known for doing justice and righteousness. A, a different biblical topic. 
Okay. So he says, let's bring the Aron here because we want to bring the Aron to Yerushalayim to make it great. And they do that. And from chapter 13 all the way to chapter 16, there's one topic, bring the Aron to Yerushalayim, what goes wrong, what goes right, and way more details than we had in Sefer Shmuel. But the big topic here is the effort to bring the Aron to Yerushalayim, what goes right, what goes wrong. Finally, in chapter 16, things are good. The Aron makes it to Yerushalayim, and he puts it in the tent, and Debbie makes a whole big celebration. He blesses the people. Everyone gets a little party bag. We have this many get weddings to this day and bar mitzvahs. You, people come to an event, you give them food to bring home, Jewish custom. And listen what Debbie does in Pasuk Dalet. Like, this is before the temple was built, but once the Aron now is in Yerushalayim, it's been collecting dust and carrot for, for decades. David sets up the first choir. What we call, this is the beginning of Sefer Tehidim. Who's the leader? Asaf Arosh. Why is this year on Tuesday? What do we say? Mizmor la Asaf this morning. That's Asaf, who was appointed by David as the chief Levite and the chief composer of, of Tehidim. In fact, what's it say at the end? Bayamahu. This is a critical um, tipping point event in Jewish history. The Aron is in Yerushalayim. We have Levim. We have a national center. We have, our, we have, our, uh, we have a choir. We have a city that's on, in motion. Got it? And what means more do they sing when they bring the Aron to Yerushalayim? I call this like a, um, a not a break, a, um, a flash mob. What, did, what does Asaf lead the people in? Oh, here's Tzukin Zimra. But we begin Didn't Avram do that for a living, calling out in God's name? Avram, this is, this is why we're chosen. Avram is a paradigm for Jewish history. We wanted people calling out in God's name, praising him, and acting in a way that's praiseworthy. We talk about him, and that's what we do in Davening. We praise God, and therefore, our opening, our opening is more of Pesukit Zimra, we praise God, like David praised God when they brought the Aron to Yerushalayim. Got that? And we quote all the way to, um, in Davening, we quote all the way to here. Vimru Hoshienu, it's in, Vimru, this is from here. Hoshienu Hashem Tishenu, v'kapsin minagoyim dodot Hashem Kachecha. That's already, now, got it? That's already by Cheni. Okay. And then we have Baruch Hashem Eli Yisrael Min Olam, Bar Olam. Okay. And they bring the Aron there. Now the Aron's in Yerushalayim, what's the next thing that's going to happen? David wants to build the Mikdash in Yerushalayim, chapter 17. And God says, not yet. Remember? This is the same as Sefer Shmuel. Here, God didn't say no. He says, not yet. Not you, but your son. Now, why not yet? That's a different reason. Uh, we're almost there, but not yet. Not you, but your son. Um, because he says there's still wars to be fought. And in Perak Yudchet and Yotet, which we're going to skip, it talks about the wars that David fights that's going to secure Yerushalayim and secure the funding to build the Mikdash in Yerushalayim. That'll be the three chapters begin. We'll see how these wars relate to um, why David can't build the Mikdash, but why he can. We get to Perach of Aleph. We have the parallel story, which is the last chapter of Sefer Shmuel, where David counts the people he shouldn't, but um, he's, you know, God gets really angry. There's this terrible epidemic um, or pandemic, and there's a play going around, and people are dying left and right, and David takes responsibility. And when David is going to pray to God. Remember, Beitai, when David saw that God answered him at the threshold of Gorin, of um, the threshold of Arnon the Jebusite, and he brought the Korban there, and the Mishkan was in, in, um, in Gibon at that time, because Nov was already destroyed by Shaul, David couldn't go to Gibon to pray, because remember the Malach was stopping in the way, and then what happens, Perech what is when God answered David's prayer and stopped the plague, what did David say? Remember David? That was David's decision. This is the place to build a house for God. And then he picks on Harbai. That's why, for this day, that's Harbai. And what's David do next? David gathers all the foreign workers to do the manual labor in the land of Israel. Sounds familiar. And they do all the stonework and all the quarrying and things like that and all the building materials and everything. And what's David tell Shlomo? Remember David and Shlomo Bani? Listen, listen carefully. The house that I'm building for God, I'm building a house for God's name. This is for God's glory, not for my glory. Okay? Now, even though David can't build it, 
God says, your son can build it. David gets everything ready. We don't know about this in Sefer Shmuel. But in Divrei Amin, David spends the rest of his life getting everything ready so when Shlomo becomes king, he has a Lego set to put together. And David got everything ready before his death. And he calls Shlomo and tells him, it's your job to build a house for Hashem, the God of Israel. And David tells Shlomo, my son, I, it was in my heart, I really wanted to build a house, l'shem Hashem Elohai. But God said, not you. Why? Because you're a man of war. You're living, you can't go public with this idea of a Mikdash until other nations respect you. In other words, David was in the right direction, but God says, in order to build a house for God, you need stability and people have to look up to you. You can't go public when people hate you. We need a generation of peace. You're a generation of war. You have a son, okay? In other words, you're a man of war. Wars you were supposed to fought, great wars. It's not David's sin. It's just David's time period wasn't ready yet for Mikdash. We didn't reach Menucha V'Nachala yet to the level that God wanted. He says, you'll have a son. He'll be a man of Menucha of rest. I'll give him rest from his enemies. Name him Shlomo. Because in order to build the Mikdash, you need peace. Shalom Shekhet Yaviyamav. Don't build a temple when you war with your enemies. You have to have peace with your enemies. He'll build a house, the bite, Lishmi, to my name. I'll be like a son. And get all these details, which are not in Shmuel, are in Divrei Amin. Because they're all about building a house for God and all the efforts that he does. And then he says, you know, God should give you wisdom. You'll be successful. And, and here's this. He in, my, in my meager efforts, I got everything ready to build a house for God, the gold, the silver, etc. And you got people here to help you. And David is worried stiff that his son is going to be like his father and make more campaigns. David says, I was a man of war, but I was a generation that had to fight wars. You have to be a man of peace. And then you can build the Mikdash. That's his big speech. And now look, from chapter, from here to the end of the book, to the end of Aleph, Chav Gimel, David organizes all the Levites. Everyone together, and they, what do you call it? They do a census of all the Levites. And they divide in chapter 24 into 24 Mishmarot. And in chapter 25, everyone gets a job. There's the singers and the organizers and the guards and everything. In chapter 26, he organizes the Kohanim into 24 Mishmarot. In chapter 27, he organizes the funding into, to, by, the, by different 12 different, every month from a different area. Got it? So the whole book is focusing on David getting ready to build the Mikdash. In Perech Avchet, which is beautiful, David gathers the whole nation together again. And he presents the, build, the, all the building materials of the Mikdash. He says again, it was in my heart to build a house for God. Right? But what he got? God told me, not me, but your son. And God picked you, Shlomo, to build it, etc. And from all my children, he's addressing the nation. He picks Shlomo. He gets everything ready. He gives a whole big speech. We don't have time to read it all. But what's important for davening is chapter 29. In public, David charges his son Shlomo. He says, Shlomo, you're my young son. God chose you. There's a lot of work to do to build this edifice for God, this birah. I got everything ready, the gold, the silver, etc. And everyone get a whole list of building materials. This is important. Everyone's super happy. Come, David was very happy. Got it? They're all donating money to God. Big thing. Keep this in mind. And then, the end of this big, the whole national gathering, everything's ready to build the Mikdash. David makes the famous benediction. Now we're at the end of Pesuket Zimra, aren't we? You follow? Hodu Lashem that begins Pesuket Zimra is when David brings the Aron to Yerushalayim and gets the movement started. By Barak David is when he finishes and has all the building materials and plans ready for the Mikdash and gives them over to Shlomo to build. Who does David think? This is important for trivia. Baruch Hashem Adolam. We say this every day. The only time in Tanakh do you have a blessing. Our whole lives, don't we make blessings? 100 a day, Baruch Hashem Adolam. The only time you have Baruch Hashem followed by a name for God is here. Nowhere else in Tanakh. In Tidim, you have one Pasach, Bruch, um, the one in Tidim, Kufi of Tet. Bruch Hashem, uh, Bruch Hashem, um, the Olam Dad Olam, or something like that, right? But not, but, but without a name for God, though. Bruch Hashem, this was an appellation. Elahi Yisrael Vinu. We say Elahi Abraham. Oh, that's Yaakov, isn't it? Why is he taking the God of Yisrael? Avinu, that's Yaakov. Not, oh, that's not Avrami second Yaakov. Why? Because who was the first person who made a neder to build a house for God? Yaakov. Remember Yaakov's dream? He said, this Evan is going to become a Beit Elohim. 
It's never built. Yaakov, when he returns, can't build it. He's got family problems. He goes down to Egypt. Amisro returns, we have a Mishkan. We never build a bait. The concept of a Beit Elohim begins with Yaakov Avinu and Beit El. Got it? And the first Jewish leader to fulfill Yaakov's nether is David HaMelech. Got it? And therefore, he's a Brochat Hashem Yisrael Avinu, Miolam Bad Olam. He has a schut to fulfill Yaakov's dream to build a house for God. We're finally settled down. Who gets the credit? You get the credit, not me. Okay? I did it, but it's your house, not mine. David doesn't want to take the credit. What's he say at the end here? Um, now, we quote this in Debra Yamim, don't we? I mean, in, in Davening. That's how we have Sukkot Zimra. Interesting, we go to Nehemia. We switch right in the middle of the sentence. We go to Nehemia about a similar um, celebration in, in Sefer Nehemiah, when they, when they finish the wall and they, and they make the Amana and they give that whole speech in Nehemiah, which uh, Professor talked about in his Shira Nehemiah, we go from there to the, from the beginning of Ayat Rishon to the beginning of Ayat Sheni. And then we get to Shira Tayyam. So again, I think my time is up for my main part. I got about half covered what I wanted to cover. Uh, let me just give a couple more real short points because you stole three minutes in the beginning with introduction, so I get to steal three minutes. Um, I'll go back to my outline, but I got to Pesukit Zimra. That's what's important, didn't we? In other words, when you daven every day now and learn Pesukit Zimra, it's not by chance it's from Dibre Yamin. It's a, it's a pivotal point in Jewish history. We finally have a political leader who's successful and great and, uh, and, and, and does, we'll see, does justice and righteousness for his people and gets Israel on the right path. But the song and the expression of dedication to God and the theme of making a name for God, Hu Lashem Kiru Bishmo, Make a name for God. Uh, and doing that begins with David, begins, it begins Sefer Tidim in his composition, and it reaches its high point in David's career with Vivarek David. And, and that's what makes David king. That's what makes his kingdom eternal because he has the right goal for the nation. His own issues, personally, that's a different topic for Sefer Shmuel between him and God. But as a national leader, he has it right. And he's the model that we pray for in Shmuel Esrei at Samach David. That's what Yirmiyahu talks about, the returning of Mahfut David. Um, then we have Borchu, by the way. The next topic is Borchu. David gets to give in. It's Borchu Nat Hashem. So after Vavarech David, we have Borchu. And we have almost a model for Sukkot Zimra ending. Now, we end there. Just a couple. Let me go back to my other. Um, I'll, I'll go over now what we're not doing. Okay. We talked about the focus on King David, uh, how everything's exclusively in Mikdash. The bad stories in the Mikdash about Yoash, they're quoted here, you'll have on the source sheet about him killing a Navi in the Mikdash, Uziel bringing Torah in the Mikdash. Because the topic is Mikdash, I have stories that relate to kings in the Mikdash, even though they're bad. Um, there's great Passovers that they both do, both in time of Chizkel and Yoshiel's time, which are way more detailed than Divrei Amim. Menashe, who's the worst king in Sefer Melachim, he does tshuva in Sefer Divrei Amim because he rebuilds the temple. He destroys it, then he fixes it back up, and, and he gets, makes things better at the end. But it's Mikdash related, so that's in Melachim. Um, we talk about why David can't build it. We have Pesukit Yisimra, we quote the things in his quote from Vision of David. And then on the source sheet, this whole theme of making a name for God, the theme from Sefer Breshit, Azazu Chalik Rav Hashem, etc. et cetera. I'll just share with you, there's a whole big theme of making a name for God that starts with Noach. It, and Migdal Babel is the opposite, making a name for man. You know that theme. And Avram, his whole life is calling out in God's name. And uh, Yitzhak does the same thing. And the Mikdash we talked about, HaMachamat Nishcher Shem Sham. We read the story from David HaMelech making a name for God when he builds the Mikdash and his farewell speech. We did all that. And when Shlomo finally builds the Mikdash, this is key, we go universal. He says, when Shlomo finally builds it, he prays and says, even a non-Jew can come. Why? Come from Florida for the sake of your name. Again, it's in Debra Yamim and also in Malachim, because you'll hear your great name. The people come and hear about God and, and they'll make a name for you, this house. And we pray to God that answer the prayer of the non-Jew. Our goal of this house will make God publicize the concept of God, not just knowing that he exists, but knowing what he expects for man to be good and kind. And we have to be his model nation. And finally, it works when the Queen of Sheba comes. This is the ancient United Emirates. The Queen of Sheba came and she heard about the name of Shlomo, the Shem Hashem, and the famous story. Now that was I and Jay. It's for Rabbi Jay. See that? We had this all planned. I ran out of time. 
So just real quick, and then I'll take the questions. I'm not two extra minutes. Um, so, um, so first we have to thank Rabbi Jay for, as soon we look backward and look forward, we always begin you know, the next topic again, we'll start an little topic. Uh, but something about the people of the book. Even when we're in exile, the book keeps us together. So what else do people look? In Judaism, it's not just the book keeps us together. If you're a Jew, if you're a Ben Torah, you don't study if you're learning, it's what you're learning. Right? In the Shiva world, right? You don't ask, are you learning? What are you learning? What mistake are you learning? What book are you learning? A Jew is always learning. Got it? And that's why I call that Torah in motion. It's, there's no such thing as a Jew not learning. Pick whatever book, but you always have to be learning. And we finish, we start learning again. Every time you learn something, you have more insights. And again, we can take this um, opportunity of Corona and say it's an opportunity. That's just you know, to complain about it, but God's okay. giving us time that we can learn, et cetera. So I want to thank Jay for uh, putting us in motion. And we can hopefully be Jews, not if we're learning, but that what we're learning. And, and learning should be growing all the time. And thank you for moving us forward. And uh, I, think, I have another thing about how I'll save this for later. Uh, based on what Professor um, Zakheim said. You know, sometimes, let me, this is important. Sometimes when we study books, we read the books and we project ourselves onto the books. Now, the other way is, the question is, do we, do we read Tanakh and use it for what we want? Do we read Tanakh and read into it our lives? Or do we read Tanakh and build our lives on it? So I'll just bring one real quick example. Ramban's commentary on Avram watching God's guard. Remember Avram, remember everyone knows Avram uh, watched God's guard and kept his mitzvot. So Ramban explains what, when he's watching his guard, believing in God, how do he watch his guard, believing in God, and keeping that mishmer in his heart, and arguing with idol worshipers about the existence of God, and calling out in God's name to bring people back to his serve. In other words, what was Avram doing for a living? He didn't, remember, it didn't keep the tariq mitzvot, they didn't, weren't given yet but he made a name for God. And he argued with idol worshipers and he brought and was an example of good behavior. And he, and he defended God by how he taught. Now, anyone who knows Ramban's life, what's that look like? That's Ramban's famous dispute with Pablo, right? So what would people say, what academics say? Oh, what's Ramban doing? He's reading his commentary of Avram Avinu into his own life. Because that's what he did, isn't it? Is, isn't this reflecting Ramban's argument with Pablo and? and arguing with idol worshipers and sticking up for God. He took the challenge in the big dispute. And you see how he understood Kriya B'Shem Hashem. If you know your history, Ramban's commentary on Chumash was written way before that argument. This Pirush was written way before that argument. And Ramban did not explain Chumash based on his life. Ramban led his life based on his commentary on Chumash. You follow? Why did Ramban step up to the plate and argue with Pablo? Why did he enter that argument? Why do you step up to the plate and defend the Torah and Judaism during the Inquisition, or before the Inquisition, but during that time period with Isabel, et cetera, whoever it was. Uh, was why did he take that debate? Because his study of Chumash, he led his life based on his study. So what I want to bless us with is that we don't just read the Torah and read what we want to find in it, but rather study the Torah and live your lives based on your study. You know, don't, don't read what you want into the text. Try to study the text as much as you can and live your life based on your study as Ramban did and as Jay is doing, etc. So thank you so much. You can drink your l'chaim and we can answer questions. <laughs> thank you very much, Rabbi Liebteg, and thank you for your kind words. Thank everybody. And uh, we do look forward to learning with everybody Thursday. We, uh, you know, you end one, you begin the other, the, the Hadron, and you go to Mayamitai Korint at Hashma. So this Thursday morning, Rabbi Alex Israel on Chodesh Elul, uh, a month of fear or a month of love. I believe that's the, this topic, the first of a four-part series. We've got lots of shurim. Rabbi Liebtag will be speaking on Slichot Night. That's Saturday night, September 12th on Yud Gimel Midot, the, which of course is the uh, basis of all of Slichot up through Yom Kippur. That's the main prayer we say. So Rabbi Liebtag will be speaking on the Yud Gimel Midot. That's uh, going to be at 10.30 p.m. Eastern Time, 5.30 a.m. in Israel on Saturday night, the, uh, September 19th, Sunday morning, September 20th. Anyways, Rabbi, there are a few questions if you want to take a quick look or I can feed them to you. No, we have feed um, them, feed them. Um, okay, so let me feed them to you and uh, we look forward to seeing everybody. Okay, so the first question somebody pointed out, which of course on Rosh Hashanah, we say the Machut, Zichronot, and Shofar, the Psukim have the Ksuvim before Nevim. So it appears how Nevim is the end of the Tanakh. In other words, why the switch? 
whether Nevi'im or Ksuvi'im is first. Okay, in general, um, the, the, this, what do we say before Ketuvim? We did very Kotshecha Ketuv Lemor. Now, who wrote Ketuvim? Ketuvim, I think some of the speakers before I mentioned, that's man-made. In other words, it's man talking to God. Nevi'im is God talking to man. Ketuvim is man talking to God. Ibrahim is a little borderline there. It's like quasi like, um, when God talks to man, that's in Nevi'im. For example, Ruth, there's no Nevu'ah in Ruth. It's a story. Even though Shmuel wrote it, Shmuel is written by a Navi, but there's no by Yidvar Hashem Alayla more. Now, but Tuvim is man-made. So I, I, I'm not sure, I don't think I'm right, but it's cute that Uvi Divrei Kotshecha Ketuv Lemor, that's referring Kotshecha as Am Yisrael. No, it's Tuvim. It's always quoting from Tilim, isn't it? But Am is spreading Tilim. I think because Tilim is we're talking to God. We're praying to God. So remember, we're this Am Kadosh. So it could be that... Um, but we, we quote from there because it's, you know, God in Chumash says one thing, and then we quote from then we to the next, and then we end with, with Nevi'im. But again, that's, that has, that's for liturgy reasons. It's not, um, it's not a question of more important or less important. It's just how we order, organize the Pesukim. I just think it's nice if we go from Navi, I mean from Chumash, then we balance to, to um, our talking to God in Tehillim, and then we go to um, Nevi'im giving rebuke. Okay, then somebody asked, and I assume the answer, the question is really part of the answer, as uh, the 70 people uh, connected to the 70 years of exile. Um, for sure, yeah, for sure. The 70 is a magic number in Chumash. 70 is, is like, it's Amisro in the nations is 70. 70 is a, it's a topology. 40 is a, t- a special number, seven is a special number, but then for sure, they're all related to that theme. And the fact that there's 70 years, the Dvar Shem is for sure the 70 nations. But it's a theme already in, in, um, in Breshit already. The question is, why is God giving Babel 70 years? Because it goes to the idea of, was whenever we have Israel and the nations, it's 70. And when God takes away our country and gives it to another nation, and God gives the nation, gives, gives them Mambachat al Bablim, it's God's relationship with, with universal relationship then the number 70 is always there. That's a big okay. thing in your meeting. All right. Now, I didn't fully understand this question, uh, I mean, on the Ibn Ezra. Divar um, Yamim, Ibn Ezra, Divar Uziel, exonerated by the Beit Din. Tries to reconcile because he introduced second Pesach according to Allah. I'm sorry, I don't fully follow the question. If you want to explain, uh, feel free to do so. Add in. Um, and that, I think, a lot of comments, but I think that's basically the only other questions I see. Um, lots of people thanking you, Rabbi. Okay. And, uh, for the series. Thank you. And, Thank everyone uh, for taking us. Okay. So if you, want, you can open up the uh, microphone if people want to yeah, ask. Yeah, it is. Questions. Anybody can unmute themselves. So anybody who would like to unmute themselves, ask a question, you're, uh, you're welcome to do so. I'm pretty sure everybody can unmute themselves. Hi. Thank you from Hi. Kent Hill, Silver Spring, Maryland. Always a pleasure. Thank you, Ariel. Can I? Yeah, can, Irene. Can I say something? Yes, sure. Thank you very, very much. Um, um, I might have made a mistake, but when I was working on Ibn Ezra, I think in his an alternative introduction to the commentary, he tried to sort of um, do a sort of reconciliation on that. I was only making a point. I'm more concerned about Rambam because I think he was supposed to have written his commentary on Torah in Akko when he had to leave. Uh, oh, Northern okay. Spain. Yeah, explain, yeah. I used to teach the history of the well, I have two neighbors who so. are very good friends of mine, Professor Yossi Ofer, and I forgot my other neighbor. Oh, yes. The professors at Barline University, they published a book recently on Ramban's commentary in Chumash, yeah. and they focused on his uh-huh. commentary that he added when he came to Israel. There's like six or seven. Most uh-huh. of the commentary, I double checked them, they're the real experts on Ramban's commentary in Chumash. Okay, I wasn't, I wasn't double check. questioning was, what he said. That commentary <laughs> is in all the texts. Yeah. The text from before the, the before his exile. He got exiled when he won the debate. He got a free one way ticket to Israel. So his commentary on Chumash was before the, the thing. There's only a couple commentaries he had afterwards. Like when he found that that Matbea, when he think where the Machzik Shekel was, he found that coin. There's a lot of cool things and the distance and things like that. That's what he added. But otherwise, um, but for sure, I double check that commentary on Avram Avinu, Abdel Chabshad. Is, uh, that was before his uh, thing. I think it's a great example how the Ramban lived his yeah. life based on his Torah 